Good morning once again. If you're, uh, if you're wondering, that photo is actually a representation of Pam trying to explain dominoes to me on game, <laughs> on game night, you know? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. No, it was a good time, and, and if, you, uh, if you ever have the opportunity to, to be up here on our, our, our next game night, then uh, you should do so. I appreciate a brother reading that. You know, by divine design, the church, we know it's a, it's a gathering of believers, a, a fellowship of the redeemed, the called out, the ecclesia, and who are bound together by a common faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Yet, the reality of human imperfection means that discord can arise even within the body of Christ. We're just human, right? Um, the Apostle Paul, in his second letter to Timothy, he writes with the urgency of a man who he knows his time is short. He knows that he's about to die. And his words, they're not just the reflections of an aging apostle, but they're the inspired counsel of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's interesting because, you know, we often think of Paul as very stoic and a long beard and stands up straight, maybe even six foot or something, or at least that's, you know, what the images that paintings maybe give us, right? But there is actually a historical record that describes this man as relatively short, hunched over, bow-legged, bald with a unibrow, you know? And that's Paul. But he had such fire and such passion when he is talking to the church about how we should conduct ourselves. And so it, it's the inspired counsel of the Spirit that addresses these timeless issues that confront the church. And so in 2 Timothy 2, 22 to 26, as our brother read, Paul addresses the matter of interpersonal conflict and discord within the church, giving Timothy and us by extension a clear and practical guide for maintaining unity and peace, which is not something that is easy to do because we are human. Paul begins by urging Timothy to flee from youthful lusts, urging him to pursue righteousness and faith and love and peace. And that opening command, it sets the stage for a deeper discussion of how a servant of the Lord is to conduct themselves, especially during controversy. Uh, Paul's advice, it's grounded in the understanding that discord in the church, it's not just a matter of personal disagreement, but it is in fact a spiritual battle, right? We wage war not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities and those things in heavenly places, he would write elsewhere. It is a spiritual battle. The church composed of individuals saved by grace is still subject to the influences of the flesh and the enemy's deceptions. And so that's why Paul doesn't just offer practical advice, but rather spiritual counsel. Discord is often fueled by ignorance, fueled by pride, lack of self-control. In verses 23 and 24, Paul zeroes in on the root causes of many quarrels within the church. He warns against engaging in foolish and ignorant speculations that they breed strife and he emphasizes that the Lord's bond servant by the way there the word is doulos in many translations it'll say bond servant but doulos the word that's used actually means slave okay so it's that the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome but kind to all able to teach and patient when wronged and the gravity of Paul's words, they cannot be overstated. So in our time, as in Timothy's, the church faces numerous challenges, both from within and from without. False teachings, uh, cultural pressures, 
personal conflicts, all of those things, they threaten the unity of the body. And so Paul's instructions are as relevant today as they were when they were first written. The Bible is timeless. And they call us to a higher Christ-like standard in how we handle disagreements. And so as we delve into the passage, we're going to explore three main points as, you know, because it's not a sermon if it doesn't have three points, right? But three main points to help us understand and apply Paul's teachings on discord in the church. The first is there in verse 23, to avoid foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Paul begins this section of his letter with a stark warning. Refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. It's kind of the idea that you don't have to attend every argument that you're invited to. You cannot show up to the party, right? Uh, The word refuse here carries the idea of deliberately turning away from something or, or rejecting it outright, not entertaining it at all. Uh, the, the, the term foolish can be understood as something that lacks wisdom or prudence, uh, it, while ignorant refers to a lack of understanding, a lack of, uh, a lack of knowledge. And so you have these things that we are to outright refuse those things that lack wisdom and lack any understanding or any knowledge. Now, Uh, The combination of those two terms, it highlights the nature of speculations that Paul's warning against. They're not just unwise, but they're also uninformed, right? I'm sure that we all at one point have even met people like that, that are not only unwise, but they are uninformed. And in the context of the church, these things, they often take the form of disputes uh, on secondary issues, Secondary issues, those matters that they're not central to the gospel, but they can quickly become points of contention, right? Uh, You know, uh, how many scriptures or readings are we going to have? How many songs are we going to sing? How long is the sermon supposed to be? Uh, What time is class starting? What time is service starting? All of these All of these things, they're not central to the gospel. And yet, because we are people, they can quickly become points of contention and and strife. And those disputes are often fueled by pride. Uh, Individuals seek to kind of insert their opinion or assert their opinion and their interpretation over everyone else. Uh, But Paul, he makes it clear that engaging... In these kinds of arguments, it's unproductive. And not only unproductive, but it's actually destructive because they produce quarrels, the exact opposite of what the church is called to be. It's secondary matters. I know people that have, would have an issue with our song leaders using a pitch pipe. You know, it's secondary. It's not central to the gospel. And a lot of the times it is fueled by people saying, I'm right, you're wrong. And then they get into to foolish arguments and disputes. To, it can even get to the degree to where there's division within the church. I've seen more congregations divide over personal opinion about non-essential matters than I ever have over doctrine. Paul's use of the word speculations is actually telling because speculations, they're not grounded in the truth of God's word. They're based on human reasoning. They're often divorced from the reality of scripture. It's the I think or I feel type of mentality. That's why they're so dangerous because they can have the appearance of wisdom, but they are in fact devoid of any spiritual value. It might be that someone says, well, you know, I've been a Christian for 40 years. And so people might give their reasoning a little bit more weight. It might sound like wisdom, but if we're not discerning, there's no real spiritual truth to it. And I'm not saying that is the case every time, but that is why we're to be watchful. In 1 Timothy 1 and verse 4, Paul, in the same way, he warns against myths 
and endless genealogies. They give rise to speculation, he says, rather than furthering the administration of God, which is by faith. Foolish arguments, disputes, those kind of side matters that don't matter a lick to the gospel at all, all they do is hold the body of Christ right where it is and prevent it from actually moving forward. There's nothing wrong with taking caution in progress or or doing things, but it's a matter of dispute. It's a matter of, is this foolish? Is it grounded in scripture? Is it just causing division? Is it not doing any good? The issue is not that questions or discussions are wrong, but when they, are they based on just someone's speculative ideas, or are they based on a solid foundation of scripture? Do they lead to division, or do they lead to edification? Quarrels in the church, they're like a cancer that eats away at the unity of the body. They divert attention away from the church's true mission, which is making disciples and proclaiming the gospel. And instead of focusing on that, people get sidetracked. In James chapter 4 and verses 1 and 2, he addresses the root cause. He says, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? So it's kind of this rhetorical question that he's presenting to the diaspora, those that are scattered out. He says, is not the source of your pleasures that wage war in your members? You lust, you don't have, so you commit murder. You are envious, you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. He he says, you want to know what your problem is, James writes? You want to know why you're arguing so much? Because you're focusing on this and you're not focusing on that. The source of quarrels is often self-centered desire to be right, to have one's own way, and that is anti-ethical to the humility and love that should characterize the church. Why are we so quickly drawn into these foolish and ignorant speculations? The answer is because we are prone to pride. And pride often manifests itself, like I said, in the desire to be right, to win arguments, to assert assert our own opinions. And, And that's compounded by the fact that we live in a culture that values individualism and self expression. Yet, as Christians, As Christians, we're called to be different, or to a different standard. Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4. Do nothing from selfish or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Don't look out, just don't only look out for your own interest, but also for the interests of others. See, when we allow our pride to draw us into these foolish speculations, we fail to live up to that standard. And pride and ignorance, they are insidious. They can easily creep into our hearts and minds without us even realizing it. That's why Paul's command to refuse these things is so crucial. Because it's from the outset. That means don't even entertain it. Now, if that means that a conversation has to be shut down, then the conversation gets shut down. Not even entertain the idea. Think of a a recovering alcoholic, and I say recovering because a recovering alcoholic won't even say they're recovering. They'll just still say that they're an alcoholic, right? So a recovering alcoholic who is wanting to stay on the wagon, as we say, right, and not have a drink, will they even entertain one drink? No. Absolutely not. And that's the idea, is that as Christians, we should not even entertain these foolish speculations that aren't grounded in anything but opinion, even though they might sound wise. And that's why we have to be discerning. Proverbs 17 and verse 14, the beginning of strife is like letting out water. So abandon the quarrel before it breaks out. You might look at it like, Plug the dam before the entire thing collapses. And the floodwaters are just everywhere. The second point is the character of the Lord's bondservant or the Lord's slave there in verse 24. 
In verse 24, Paul shifts from a warning about the dangers of foolish speculations to describing the character that should define the Lord's slave. Now, I mentioned before that the term there, bondservant, is doulos, and that's significant because it emphasizes the believer's complete submission and loyalty to the Lord. A bondservant, a slave, is not his own. He belongs entirely to his master, and his conduct reflects his master's reputation. And so the character of the Lord's slave is of utmost importance, especially dealing when dealing with discord in the church. Paul identifies four key characteristics that should define the Lord's slave. Number one, he must not be quarrelsome. Must not be quarrelsome. Number two, he must be kind to all. Kind to all. Number three, he must be able to teach. And number four, and this might even be the more difficult one, must be patient when wronged. Each of those are crucial in maintaining the unity and peace in the church. You think of being not quarrelsome, the first characteristic that he mentions. That command, it's a continuation of Paul's earlier warning against foolish speculations. The slave of the Lord is to be a peacemaker, not a troublemaker. Jesus himself said, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called, what? The sons of God, there in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 9. This slave is to reflect the character of Christ, who is the prince of peace, not the prince of arguing. On the other hand, quarrelsome demonstrates the character of the flesh, which opposes, opposes the spirit. There are Galatians 5, 19 through 21. That lists out strife. It lists out disputes. All of those things, the deeds of the flesh. It's supposed to be kind to all. That second characteristic, the Lord's slave is to be kind to all. Kindness is not selective. It extends to everyone, even to those who oppose or wrong the slave. This kind of kindness, it's a re reflection of God's own character. In Luke chapter 6 and verse 35, Jesus commands, Love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Now, I know we don't like talking about this because, quite frankly, it is a black eye on American history. But I want us to just briefly consider the conduct of a slave. Now, I say American history, but truthfully, it's the world's history because every people has been enslaved at one point or another, even God's own people in the Old Testament. Consider the conduct of a slave that they were told to act a certain way, just as Scripture tells Christians how we are to behave. And when someone wronged them, no matter how much they may have wanted to throttle that person, that was not permitted in the position that they were in. Just as Christians, being slaves to God, slaves to Christ, slaves to the cross, there is a conduct that is expected of us. And no matter what the other person is, whether they are a fellow slave, whether they are just someone who is evil, whether they are someone who has wronged us, we don't get to choose to just lash out on our own and still say, this one is my master. It is kind to all. It is not selective. We are, the kindness of the Lord's slave is not just human kindness. It's a spiritual kindness empowered by the Holy Spirit that reflects the love and the grace of God. I mentioned that we wrestle not against flesh and blood. 
That's one thing that we need to keep in mind when dealing with other people. We're not at war with that person. We might be at war with the mindset. We might be at war with the ideology that they hold or the lifestyle that they procure for themselves. But we are ultimately at war with one adversary. We look out at the world and we see like we are a small army against a vast force. No, it's just one. One that we're at war with, the great adversary. The third characteristic is the ability to teach, or the able to teach, rather. The Lord's slave is not only to avoid quarrels and exhibit kindness, but to be a teacher. That implies that the bondservant is grounded in the truth of God's word and can instruct others in the truth. You might tie that to the Great Commission over in Matthew 28, verse 19 and following. The ability to teach is crucial in the context of church discord because many quarrels, remember, they come from misunderstanding or misinterpretations of Scripture. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, Paul urges Timothy, Be diligent to present yourself approved unto God, a workman not ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Now let me ask you, if you have, let's say, ten Christians in a room, and only one of them really studies the Bible, who do you think is going to win the argument? It's going to be the one that studies their Bible. And the reason being is because they can, and I'm not saying they're presenting the Bible in truth. I just said they studied their Bible. Because they can make the better argument. They can twist scriptures if they're going to twist scriptures, if they are that type of person and so inclined. They can say things that appear biblical yet are found nowhere in scripture. And if you don't believe that to be the case, all you got to do is turn on TBN or any of those other religious stations, and you see that's how masses are duped. We need to be able to understand Scripture. Because even if, let's say, you've got 50% of that 10, so five know the Bible and five don't, and let's say four of the five who do, Well, they're just still out for their own gain. You can be the one who tries to call people back to God's word. The ability to know God's word and to be able to explain God's word to other people, it's not just about discipleship. It's not just about conversion. But it's also to call people back to what God would have us to do and to be the people that God would have us to be. Accurate teaching, it's the antidote to ignorance and false speculations. The fourth characteristic is to be patient when wronged. To be patient when wronged. The Lord's slave must be patient when wronged. That patience is not just passive endurance, but it's an active forbearance. It's the ability to endure insults and injuries and wrongs without, re- without retaliating and without harboring bitterness. If you ever watch public debates, you'll have two people debating, and then one will win by their argument. And you can tell because the other person all of a sudden starts in- insulting their character, you know, or they'll insult, they'll insert, insult their clothes or their physical stature or something. They'll attack the individual instead of the argument. Because the reality is that they have no argument. So being able to take those insults, to take those injuries without retaliation or harboring bitterness, it does more good than you think it does. Because the other person comes off looking insane and looking foolish. Whereas we are portraying the patience exemplified by Christ, who in 1 Peter 2 and verse 23, while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. You might also want to jot down Psalm 7 and verse 11 that says, the Lord is a righteous judge who is angry with the wicked every day. 
The prophet Isaiah would say that he was led to, like a sheep to, uh, to his shears is silent. He was silent. He didn't open his mouth. Think about that. You read through the four gospel accounts, reading through the crucifixion. He's, when he's being whipped, he's not saying a word. When they're pushing the crown of thorns down with a, thick, uh, with a stick onto his head, not saying a word. When he is carrying his cross, he's not saying a word. It's only when he gets to the cross that we have those seven sayings of Christ, and one of them is, Father, forgive them, for they do know not what they do. That's the patience, that's the endurance that we're supposed to have. You know how it goes, rather be silent and thought a fool than to open my mouth and remove all doubt, right? Sometimes. <laughs> you think of the image of a shepherd guiding his flock. A good shepherd doesn't respond to the sheep's straying with harshness or, or anger, but instead he patiently guides them back to the fold, caring for them even when they wander. In the same way, the Lord's slave is a guide to the flock of God with patience and kindness, even in the face of opposition and wrongs. And, and these characteristics, they are not reserved just for elders or preachers or deacons, but these are characteristics that every faithful Christian should be working towards. And we think, how do we cultivate that? Well, the answer lies in our relationship with Christ. We cannot produce these characteristics of our own strength. They're the fruit of the Spirit. They're in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It's not natural to us. As we abide in Christ, submitting to his lordship and being filled with his spirit, he will produce these qualities in us. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. As the truth of God's word renews our minds and as we submit ourselves to the leading of the Spirit, we will be transformed into the image of Christ. That is a promise. Last point, gentle correction and repentance. Gentle correction and repentance. In verses 25 and 26, Paul, he addresses how the Lord's bondservant is to correct those in opposition. So we have one that we're to reject them outright. Don't even engage in these things. But they still happen. So we've got the four characteristics of how we're to respond in those situations. With kindness, with patience, with the ability to teach, and so on, right? So then we get to, okay, when they're done hooting and hollering, or we're in the middle of it, how do I correct the error, right? Well, Paul addresses that in verses 25 and 26. The word here is gentleness. Simple word. It's not the gentleness, though, of weakness or timidity, but the gentleness of strength under control. Again, we look to Christ we sing, and he could have called 10,000 angels, right? Do not mistake his meekness for weakness. It is gentleness that is strength under control. It's the same gentleness Christ displayed when he invited the weary and the burden to come to him there in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 29. Take my yoke upon you. Learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart. Learn these things. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. It's essential to the process of correction. Paul's instruction to correct with gentleness, not a suggestion. If you notice, if you have your Bibles open there, it's not a suggestion. It's a command. It's to be applied even when the opposition is strong. It's to be applied even when the correction is difficult. Because we're having to have patience. 
Some people will understand a point that you're a correction that you're trying to give a lot easier than others. We are all in different places in life. We are all in different places in our Christian walk. We are we all come from different backgrounds and have different experiences. Some people will understand that gentle correction easier than others. And so patience and humility have to become a part of that. The goal of correction, it's not to win an argument. And it's not to assert your own authority, but it's to lead the opposing person to a repentance and to a knowledge of the truth. Now you might say, why repentance? Because they've done that which Paul by the Spirit, so coming from God, said not to do, which they engaged in these stupid arguments. I can say stupid. Our brother read it. It's in the Bible. Okay. So there's, a, so there's not only a matter of, look, you're engaging in things that you should not be engaging in. And, and I understand. We might say, oh, it's an argument. It's a disagreement. Well, what we consider small is grave to God. I mean, after all, Jesus, he sat there and he taught, you're angry with your brother? Yeah, that's murder. You lust after a woman? Yeah, that's adultery. Jesus standard way up here, you know? And so it's, it's, not ju- it's not about winning an argument. It's about you were engaging in something that God says we shouldn't be doing. You need to repent of that, and let's look at the truth. Not my truth, because I have no truth. I hate it when people say that. Speak your truth. Be quiet. You have no truth. John 17 and verse 17, thy word is truth. You have your perception of truth, but we're trying to lead them to that. The, the repentance can't be forced can't be manipulated. It's the work of God. Repentance is not when you cry. Repentance is when you change. Gentleness is vital in that correction because it opens the door for the Spirit to work in the heart of the one being corrected. Harshness, aggression, they provoke defensiveness and resistance. Proverbs 15 and verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. When correction is given in a spirit of gentleness, it reflects the love and grace of God. Some people aren't going to accept that. Some people will even get more upset. They'll get angrier because you're so calm. Have you ever met one of those people? You know, they are just fuming. You can almost see the steam coming out of their ears. And you're just cool, cool as a cucumber as it goes, right? And they're, they just get even more mad. Why aren't you mad? Do you not care about this? Do you not care? Why are you mad? And they just get more and more and more upset, you know? And we've just got to be more and more patient and more and more gentle. I know sometimes we might be praying like the Old Testament. Oh, Lord, is this one of those times I could dump hot coals on their head? You know? But it's reflecting the love of God. The ultimate purpose, it's not just a behavioral change, but it's a spiritual transformation. Uh, Paul desires that those in opposition, he says, may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. Those who oppose the truth, they're not just misguided. They are trapped. And they're held captive. The goal of correction is to free them from captivity. Think of a gardener. I've been looking into gardening a lot lately. I guess it's a good time. I mean, it's fall, so maybe I'm wrong. Maybe one of y'all can help me afterwards. But Think of a gardener carefully kind of tending to the plants and stuff, right? And when he notices a branch going in the wrong direction, he doesn't just yank off the branch or he doesn't uproot the plant. No, instead he prunes it 
right? And, and he gently kind of guides it through the lattice work or something, kind of going in the right direction. And it's the same way. In the same way, the Lord's slave is to gently correct those who are in opposition, not sit there and yank them out of the ground or by their by their neck or anything and start strangling the person. No, is that we're to sit there and we, we prune off the things that don't work? And we just kind of gently guide in, in the way that they should go. Our ultimate goal in correcting others, it should be their spiritual growth and their restoration. We might end up in the wrong. And what I mean by in the wrong, we might lose the argument. But again, we're not trying to, lo- we're not trying to win an argument. I'll, we can lose an argument all day long, but if we gain our brother and sister in Christ, that is all the better. We're trying to help the person grow in their faith into a deeper understanding. Galatians 6 and verse 1, Brethren, even if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. So you're looking out for them. You're looking out for you. The goal is restoration, and the means to that end is gentleness. Francis de Salle once said, nothing is so strong as gentleness, nothing so gentle as real strength. Many congregations falter. And they falter because people's opinions. They falter because of strife that is stirred up when it need not be. They falter because, you know, the, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. The, the loudest person wins. The one that stands out wins. And, and no one is seeking God and, and trying to do that in gentleness and to be patient. That's the way that people grow. Uh, growing... In the shadow of the cross, it it isn't just about intellectual knowledge, but it's about our character. It's about our our mindset. It's how we respond to difficulties and, and persecutions. How we are able to maintain the strength that we have. Because we do have strength in Christ. Paul said, you are more than conquerors through Christ. And we're never going to to win people over if we're always getting in the way. I pray that each of us works on committing these things. Gentleness, teaching others, responding with the truth. Here in just a moment, Brother Perry is going to lead us in our hymn of invitation where you can respond if you need the prayers of the congregation. Pray with you and for you under the throne of Almighty God. If you want to talk about baptism, what it means to be a Christian, we can do that as well. If you want to set up a time and we can talk afterwards, that's that's fine as well. You'll have an opportunity to do that, but first let's pray together. Our sovereign Lord and almighty God, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude for the truths through your word. We thank you for the instruction Paul gave to Timothy by the Spirit, showing us how to conduct ourselves as your servants within the body of Christ. Lord, we acknowledge that we are often prone to pride and quarrels, quick to engage in foolish disputes, and slow to extend the kindness and patience you've shown us. Father, we ask for your forgiveness for the times we have allowed discord to take root in our hearts and in our congregations. Lord, we ask that you mold us into the image of your Son so that we might be known for our gentleness, our love for the truth, and our unwavering commitment to the unity of your church. Father, grant us the wisdom to avoid those foolish speculations and disputes that lead to strife and fill us with the grace to correct those who oppose your truth with gentleness. We recognize, Lord, that we cannot do this on our own. 
So we ask that your spirit would empower us, renewing our minds and transforming our hearts so that we might live the lives that are pleasing to you. Father, we pray for your church, our congregation here at Freetown to shine in a dark world where your truth is proclaimed boldly and your love is demonstrated in every interaction. May we be people who pursue peace, are patient when wronged, and always seek the restoration and growth of our brothers and sisters in Christ. Father, we ask that you would use us, though we are weak vessels, to bring glory to your name and to advance your kingdom here on earth. Father, we pray this in the name of your Son and our Lord and Savior, Jesus, who is the Christ. Amen.